us in worship and stand. You make the darkness run and hide. You bring the broken back to life. Only you can, only you can. You set me free from every chain. You fill my heart with songs of praise. Only you can, only you can. Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake. My heart beats only for your glory. My hands reach up for you to hold me. My soul sings, Father, you are holy. My feet dance to rhythm, to rhythm. Every beat is calling, every beat is calling out your name. run away back home only you can only you can you give me love you give me life you keep me dancing through the night only you can only you can my heart beats only for your glory my hands reach up for you to hold me my soul sings father you are holy my feet Yeah. 
Me. 
for today, and I thank you, everyone here, and I thank for the opportunity for us to be able to come here together and worship you during these crazy times. And I pray that you touch hearts and minds today to what Brian has to say. In your name I pray, amen. As these guys are walking away, I just want to say we are blessed with an amazing worship band. Troy does a great job with that ministry, and I am so glad that we have the opportunity to come before God with them leading us into worship. They do a wonderful, wonderful job, so let's give them a round of applause. Thank you guys very, very much. Um, well, we are in the last day of our lockdown series, and I would love, love, love to say that this was the last day of the pandemic. Right? I mean, there would be some amens to that, correct? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, it would be wonderful. And, and it's been tough, hasn't it? It's been hard. Um, I wish it wasn't here. There's not a day I don't pray that it go away. But I want to give you guys some encouragement here. Because through the pandemic, through the craziness, through how hard this has been, Parkview Christian Church, you guys have been great. Thank you so much for how generous this church has been. I just want to do another shout out to our Caring Closet people. Uh, Parkview Christian Church, for them to be able to show our community the love by giving them the school system, the K through 6th graders in the public school, all of their school supplies. I tell you what, I am blown away by how generous you guys are. So that's you, that's you guys, and that's our church. You guys also, the members of this church, have been extremely positive to the leadership here. So thank you for that. You guys have been so easy going and going with the flow, at least that's what you guys have expressed to me. So thank you for that, even though maybe there's been times where it has been kind of hard. And there's been some times where I really wish I knew the future. But here's the thing, guys. I think I do know the future a little bit. And that is, I still believe that Parkview Christian Church will be better at the end of this than when we open it up, than when this whole thing happened. I believe that Parkview Christian Church, that we will be closer to God when it ends, whenever that might be, than when we were on March, whatever day that this whole thing started. And how do we do that? Well, we do that through getting into the Bible. We do that by spending time to God. We do that by prayer. Because if we want to change this world, if we want revival to happen, where does it start? It starts in the hearts of God's people. And we can do that anywhere, anytime, even in a pandemic. And we've seen this through a guy named Paul. Here's a guy that knew all about isolation. Here was a guy that was quarantined. Now, this was a very nice and pleasant way to say that he was a prisoner. Paul was stuck in prison. He didn't get to go where he wanted. He didn't get to do what he wanted to do. He didn't get to be with the people he wanted to be with. So what did he do? <clears throat> he did those things that he knew he could. He drew closer to God. And he sent letters to the people that he wanted to talk with from prison. And we've seen that through the series. We saw through Colossians that we saw that Jesus is still Lord. We saw in Ephesians that we're still blessed. And we saw in Philippians that joy is still available to us. But even through all that teaching that Mark did that was great, I think we can still admit that it's still hard, right? This pandemic has been hard, and it's been especially hard on our relationships. Now, one of my guilty pleasures on the internet is to go to the site called Board Panda. Board Panda has some, it's got some silly stuff, but just recently they kind of asked people, how has the pandemic been on your relationship? And people tweeted in some pretty interesting responses. And I'm gonna read some of you, some of those to you right now. Um, so this is Board Panda's how quarantine has affected their relationships. Okay, Tom Santo Padre says, before I got married, I didn't even know there was a wrong way to put milk back into the fridge. Vision board, she said this was a conversation between her and her husband. Husband, I heard a symptom of the virus is having no taste. Me, looking at his shoes. You should get tested. Dude bro dad, he posted this picture and he said, every husband 
in the background of a Zoom meeting. All right, I thought it was funnier than you guys did. All right, that's all right. Rainbow Kingdom. I love this one. She says, my husband and I were having a hypothetical conversation about opening a restaurant after all of this is over. And it was really fun until we started to disagree on how we'd run things and who we'd hire. And now our restaurant is going under and we're getting a divorce. Okay, Eric Spiegelman. He said, my wife and I play this fun game during quarantine. It's called, why are you doing it that way? And there are no winners. Okay, my last one, and this one is probably my favorite, by Stephen Shaggy. He says, for sure, during quarantine, I've learned that my incredible wife loads the dishwasher like a serial killer. And now I question everything. <laughs> all right, all right. One thing that we've learned in this pandemic, and it's taught us, it's taught us a lot about our relationships. And through all this, we've learned that love is essential if we want to make those relationships last. So we know that Jesus is still Lord. We know that we're still blessed. And we know that joy is still available to us. But we're going to close with this reminder that love is still powerful. One of the, and this is one of the biggest messages of the New Testament. It is just you know filtered through the entire New Testament. But we see it greatly demonstrated in one of the smallest letters that Paul wrote a specific church about love being powerful. And we see that letter in Philemon. But before we get there, I want us to discuss a little bit of the backstory because this church that he's writing to, and this man Philemon in particular, he mentions in Colossians, Colossians chapter 4 to be exact. Paul says this to that church that he's going to be writing to, and in this letter that we're going to be discussing a little bit more in Philemon. In Colossians, he says this. He says, Tychicus will give you a full report about how I'm getting along. He's a beloved brother and a faithful helper who serves me in the Lord's work. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. I'm also sending Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, one of your own people, he and Tychicus will tell you everything that's happening here. Now, Paul is telling the church, I'm sending back someone you know, but maybe you didn't know this guy's full story. Maybe you didn't know what this man, Onesimus, has been doing for me. Okay, so I'm going to have a cast of characters that's going to be up there on the, on the screen, kind of giving you an idea of who some of the players are. We have Paul, he's the apostle, he wrote these letters. We have... This guy, Onesimus, now here's the thing about Onesimus, is that Onesimus was a runaway slave. Now, he wasn't a very good slave, because what, good slaves don't run away. He also, we find out, wasn't a very useful slave. And now, whether or not you're a good slave if you run away or not run away, that's, that's yet, you know, we could have that discussion. But here's where this whole story gets a little uncomfortable. Because this slave's owner was a leader in the church at Colossae. All right, and that guy's name was Philemon. And I would say that should make you, and it makes me, a little bit uneasy. Because is the church supposed to be like that? Okay. But Onesimus, he thinks... I'm going to run away, and I'm going to go to the big city. He's going to go to Rome, because if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, right? He goes, I'm going to, I'm going to escape my master's sight, but we find out, just like many times, he still couldn't escape the sight of God. Onesimus thinks, I'm just going to attempt to lose myself, but while he's doing this, he actually finds himself. And when he, Onesimus runs to Rome, he meets this guy named Paul. And Paul was a prisoner. He's in chains. And they get a friendship. They get a relationship. Now, for some of you, we're just going to stop. This is the big idea. Because there are people out there, they know a runaway. You know someone that they're running away and they're a fugitive. They're running away maybe from their family. They're running away from their values. Maybe they're running away from their responsibilities. Maybe they're running away from their faith. And here's the thing that you might need to hear. 
never stop praying for runaways. Never stop praying for them because our God, He specializes in search and rescue. So here we have Philemon. He's this slave owner. He's lost his slave Onesimus, who Onesimus has found himself as a follower of Jesus. But here's what happens because Jesus transforms people, right? Onesimus, he lives up to his name. He used to be not a very useful slave, but he becomes a useful brother in Christ to Paul. Onesimus, he has never been happier. Philemon, he doesn't know what's going on. Onesimus, he's living the life he was meant to live. He's being useful. He knows Jesus now, but as it seems in all stories, something goes a little haywire. Now, this isn't in the Bible, but I think we can surmise a few things. There was a guy named Epaphras. Now, Epaphras, he was like the pastor teacher in the church of Colossae, which was where Philemon was also from. But Epaphras, he gets some teachings that he, he doesn't really completely understand. And so Epaphras decides, well, I'm just going to go to the source. I'm going to go to the leading theologian in the area, who would have been Paul. So he gets all the stuff. He goes to Rome. Now, remember, he's from Colossae. Philemon's from Colossae. Epaphras shows up to Rome, sees Paul, and guess who else he also sees? He sees Onesimus. And he thinks, hey, I know that guy. At which point, if Paul didn't know Onesimus' whole story, guess what? He does now. And this is where the story even takes a crazier turn. Because Paul is convicted of something that would see com seem completely crazy to us. And it seems completely counterintuitive. Paul is convicted that he needs to send Onesimus back to his slave owner. Now, that to me, I mean, that's surprising. I mean, it's like, how in the world does that ever seem right? Now, I think we need to step back just a little bit, and we need to think about what did slavery look like in Paul's day? Because it was a little different than how we see it today. Now, first, first thing is that Paul lived in a culture where there was every culture, every people, there were slaves there. Now, that does not make it right. I'm just saying that that's that was part of what was going on. Now, what was very different than the way we see and have experienced slavery in America was that it was not a race-based slavery back in that time. That slaves could look indistinguishable from a, from a free man. Slaves could also have places of power and honor. You think about Joseph in Egypt. I mean, he was the second most powerful person in Egypt and he was a slave. As a matter of fact, many people went into slavery because they needed to pay off debts. And they could eventually pay their way out because slaves were often paid. In those times, they didn't separate families that were slaves. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were very, very harsh words to slave owners and how to treat slaves, and they were supposed to treat their slaves with honor and dignity. And the New Testament also says that if you were a slave, that you needed to do everything in your power to buy your way out and to be a free person. Okay, with all of that said, I want to be very, very clear about one thing. Slavery is still slavery. Okay, I am in no way saying that it is right. I'm just trying to say that maybe we need to put our, put our feet into salt's sandals and understand that maybe things were just a little different. But here is what wasn't different, and here is where it, slavery is just completely and totally wrong, is that first and foremost, another person should never, ever, ever be someone else's property. Can we all agree on that? Yes. Okay. At that time, and the thing that ever should never happen is that we treat someone as purely a way for us to get ahead financially. Also, completely wrong. So slavery should bother us. And we're going to see from Paul's writing in this tiny little letter how he revolutionized how the church should see slavery. Now Paul knows that this is going to be a bombshell. Paul knows that this is going to be a, a blast to Philemon and to the church. And so when he sends Onesimus back to Colossae, to Philemon, he also sends Tychicus with him. 
because he knows Onesimus is going to need a witness because if Onesimus shows up by himself with this letter, they're going to say, there's no way that Paul wrote this. You wrote this yourself because it was so groundbreaking. Now, let's make the story just a little bit more uncomfortable. Guess where the church met? In Philemon's house. And we see that in verse 1. It says, I'm writing this to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister Apipha and our fellow soldier Archippus, and to the church that meets in your home. So we have this church leader. He's a slave owner. It's kind of weird in and of itself. This person, Apipha, probably his wife. Archippus, probably Philemon's son. Probably 50 to 75 people would have met in Philemon's courtyard. Philemon would have sat at a table at the front of the courtyard with his wife. Now, he had servants. He may have had, well, it says he had some slaves, and they would have been around the edge, and they would have kneeled, or they would have been standing during this time. So Tychicus, he comes with this letter, and he's out in front of all these people, and he says, I'm going to read this letter because most people were illiterate at that time. But with Tychicus, There's another guy who, who, remember, 50 to 75 people there would have recognized. They would have said, hey, the runaway slave's back. Onesimus, here's this guy. That guy was was useless. They all knew what would have happened. They knew that that he ran away. He he wasn't doing what a slave's supposed to do, right? So Tychicus. He reads the letter to the people. He said, I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith to the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. And I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort. My brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. Can you imagine his wife, Philemon's son, and they're looking around, they're saying, that's my guy, that's my husband, that's my dad, that's wonderful. But Philemon, on the other hand, I wonder if he knew that he's being set up. The letter goes on, Paul's writing. He says, that's why I'm boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do. But because of our love, I prefer simply to ask you. Now it's getting a little tense. Consider this a request for me, Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. Can you kind of feel Paul? He's putting on the guilt trip here. He says, I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Now, at this point, everybody's eyebrows are going up. They're saying, useless Onesimus? Did we hear that right? He became a Christian, and Paul is the one that led him there? Onesimus hasn't been much use to you in the past, and they're all nodding their heads, but now he's very useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. I wanted to keep him here with me while I am in these chains for preaching the good news. Paul, he's really laying it on thick now, and he, and he says he would have helped me on your behalf. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to, to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever, forever for he is no longer. Now here it comes. Are you ready? You're not going to find literature like this in any other source in antiquity. Paul says, Onesimus is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave. He is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean so much more to you, both as a man and a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And now Paul finally puts the final nail in the coffin. And he says, if, you wronged, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, Charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. And I won't mention that you owe me your very souls. Now, isn't this a little uh, ironic that Paul says, I won't mention, then what's he do? He then just mentions it. Um, he says, yes, my brother, please do this me this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. This was probably an uncomfortable day at church. Can you imagine what communion would have felt like and been like during that time? But for us, as followers of Jesus, 
There are no exceptions, there are no exemptions, and there are no excuses that we are to love everyone. Because love is always essential. Love is always essential, even when it's messy. And I would say, sometimes, especially when it's messy. But here's the point. Right now in this pandemic, while we're sheltering in place, while we're wearing masks, while we're dealing with e-learning, we know, we know right now God's love can never be quarantined. And so what can we do with this? What can I do? What can you do? Well, first thing we can do is that we can still decide to love. We can still decide to love. Now, I think it's very, very significant that Paul did not play the apostle card. Did you notice that? He never brought it up. He he did say, you know, I could demand this of you, but instead, I just want to ask you what he's saying. Paul is saying to Philemon, he's saying, I am not going to treat you like a subordinate because Philemon, I don't want you to treat Onesimus like a subordinate. Now, this has always been one of the struggles of humankind. Someone always wants to be on top, and they want to lord it over other people. And sadly, this has also snuck its way into church. I mean, the disciples themselves struggled with this concept. See, Jesus was walking along one time, and the disciples came up to him and said, you know, hey, Jesus, when you overthrow the Roman government, who's going to be at your right and left hands? And how did Jesus respond? Jesus said, that's not how this works. That's not how the kingdom of God works. That's not what I'm setting up. See, gospel communities do not lord it over one another. So Paul is not going to resort to the same kind of power structures that he wants Philemon to abandon. See, this request is not from an apostle to a slave owner to a slave. No, the request is from a brother to a brother about another brother. Because being a Christian, it changes the way we look and we see people. Because when you become a Christian, you recognize that all people are made in God's image, and all people matter to God, and all people matter to someone else. Paul said, Onesimus, I am his spiritual father, and he is my spiritual child. My very heart comes with him. And so we've got to ask the question, how should we treat people differently? Those people that we see face-to-face, those people that we talk with online, those people that we deal with at the counter at McDonald's, if we recognize that they are special, not only to our God, but to someone else, We can never write anyone off as useless. We can never write anyone off as hopeless. And that's why we keep praying, and that's why we keep pursuing. We have to decide to love. Now, that's easy to say, and it's very easy easy to believe in the hypothetical. But when's it get hard? Well, it gets hard when it comes personal. Especially when you have been unfairly treated when you've been wronged, someone has done something to you that's just completely awful and it wasn't your fault. That's when it becomes personal. How do we treat that person? Because our God is a God of reconciliation and here's what we have to decide. We have to decide, am I going to love the people around me the way I want the God I worship to love how I love, love me? Will we extend grace freely even when it's extremely costly? So then we have to provide for love. And that's our second point. We can still provide for love. Now, this is what I love about the story. Because even though Paul, even though he wasn't responsible for any of the mess that Onesimus and Philemon have found themselves in, who decides to pay for that mess? Well, Paul does. He says, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. Now, do you suppose Onesimus owed 
Philemon something? Well, he probably did. I mean, it says that he, he took some of Philemon's money to fund his escape. There's a good chance that the reason that Onesimus was a slave was because he got into debt, and either Onesimus had paid that debt, and so he became a slave, or maybe he owed on, Onesimus owed Philemon some money. But Paul comes in, and he is willing to pay this debt so that this man could find freedom. In short, Paul was willing to do for Onesimus what Jesus had done for Paul. Jesus extended grace to Paul freely. And how costly was that? And that's why I've decided we're going to take Lord's Supper at the end of this sermon. Because we take the Lord's Supper each and every week to remind us how expensive that price was. Because the ministry of reconciliation, it's going to cost us. And I think through this pandemic, it's become very, very clear that paying that price doesn't come very easily for us, right? Okay, let's think about just one of the simple things, toilet paper. How well did we as people do with toilet paper during the pandemic? Not very well, because how much toilet paper do you need in your home? Obviously, two rooms full, right? Okay, now here, I, might, I, I don't want to step on anybody's toes or whatever, but here's another example of love through this pandemic. How about masks? Okay, how well have we done with the masks? Uh, now, I know that there can be lots of debate. Okay, there could be the debate of I've done all sorts of study and, and find scientific studies that masks don't work. But there's a flip to that, right? Because there's all sorts of scientific studies out there that masks do absolutely work. Okay? But for me as a Christian, that's not the question I ask myself. The question I ask myself is, what's the most loving thing I can do for my community? And so, that's why, I know this is hypocritical, I'm up here preaching to you guys without a mask, all right? But that's why when I go to Walmart, when I go to Bilo, when I, when I go see people <coughs> out in public, I wear a mask because I want to exercise my freedom, Galatians 5 freedom, to show my love to other people. And that's why I wear a mask. Because love is most powerful when the cost gets really personal. And right now, there's somebody out there that probably owes you something. They may owe you some respect, they may owe you attention, they may owe you an explanation, maybe they owe you an apology. But right now, you can decide to forgive it. You can decide to say, hey, just, just charge it to me. And we see this through how Paul intentionally ends this letter. He says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in your spirit. And grace, this is the great equalizer, isn't it? Grace reminds us that we all stand equally before the throne of God. And when we recognize how much grace God has given us, then I don't know how, if we recognize the, just the full amount and how awful we are and that God still gave up His Son for us, when we recognize the depth of that, how do we not express it through love towards our neighbors? And I think this is how this story ends, because tr church tradition says that 50 years after this letter, that there was a certain bishop in the church of Ephesus. Now, the church of Ephesus at that time was a very influential church, probably the most influential in that area. And who do you suppose was that church bishop? Onesimus. Because grace changes people. In an enemy situation, Christians can still love, but we see that in every situation, love still works. And we've got to ask ourselves another question, do we believe that? Do you believe doing the right thing, loving people, that it's going to make a difference, that it's going to work, and it's what we as Christians should do? Because if that's the case, then we need to give up that the striving for the sword and for the power that we've got to be the ones in charge. Instead, we have to go the path of the cross. 
Because if we believe that love still works, we believe that good is still better than evil, we believe that sacrifice is mightier than self-interest, we believe that love is greater than hate, we believe that love is still powerful. A great example of this was a story told by Rick Ashley about a member of his church that's a very devout Christian, but this woman is also the assistant chief of police of the Fort Worth Police Department. See, during the George Floyd protests, there was one evening in particular that things started getting a little tense. And the police didn't know exactly what to do, but this woman, Julie Swearingen, she took it upon herself to act out love In a messy situation, she believed that love was the best way to handle it. And the situation, with a group of people that were getting very angry, they were getting very upset, a group of people that had broken curfew, she approached them with love and diffused the entire situation. This is how she did it. These are her words. She says, I'll be honest, I was scared. I knew what would take place if the chief and I approached the crowd. But there was so much that I didn't know, too. As I walked to the car with Chief Krause, I prayed for protection, calm, and peace. As I was putting on my pulp-proof vest, God reminded me of how his son was ridiculed, hated, and beaten when he approached people. I was also reminded that we should only fear God. I suddenly felt the Spirit, and I felt, I finally, I suddenly felt the Spirit, and I felt overwhelming comfort and reassurance that our Father, He had us. I knew exactly what I was supposed to do at that very moment. We walked to the crowd. We were immediately approached with angry, hateful words. I listened quietly, and when given the opportunity to speak, I apologized for what had happened. I told them. I felt the same and understood their frustration. And as we worked our way around, people yelled different things. I tried to focus on what I heard and listen to the things that could actually use to change the way things are happening. One thing I heard was, y'all need to change. I turned to Chief Krause and said, did you hear that? Let's be examples. And I took that as a sign to show solidarity and to take a knee with the protesters. As we did, we were met with yelling, you're lying. But there was a young man next to me and he tried to calm the group. I asked him if we could pray. He agreed and he tried to quiet the group to pray. Now I'm going to tell you right now, I have great conversations with the Lord, but I'm not a person who confidently prays out loud. But when I opened my mouth, the words formed and they just came out. I wasn't sure what I had said until somebody sent me some of the prayer they recorded. So I know with all my heart and soul, God had us and will continue to have us. We have to do our part and trust in our Father because the Word says love is the most important thing. So that's what I told, that's what I hold on to. Love all. Love still works. Even when it's risky, even when it's messy, and even when it's going to cost us. And those are probably the times, I would say those are the times, that we need to love that much more. Okay, so as I said, I decided we're going to wait to do communion until this time. Jason's going to come up here in just a little bit, and he's going to give our community meditation. But here's the great thing about how we're doing communion now, is that if there is someone that you need to show love to, I want you to contemplate on that. Is there someone that you need to go to? Is there some debt that you need to forgive? And how can we show love to our community the best way, and sometimes it might cost us? Now, we've all experienced a time in our life when we had the choice to forgive somebody. Normally, when this happens, we either forgive or we forget. Sometimes we do both, but no matter what we do, we're always expected by God to forgive. Almost everyone could think of a time when that happened, and chances are, if you can remember it right now, it bothered you, and that's why you can remember it now. Now, when someone makes a mistake, we're expected by God to forgive them just as he forgives us when we make mistakes. Thing is, God forgives you for your mistakes instantly. 
And while we are supposed to do that as well, normally we don't. Now, the Lord's Prayer, which is the only time in the Bible when God said specifically how we are supposed to pray, says this. Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God forgives us our trespasses, and now it's our turn to hold up on our end of the bargain. Let's forgive those who trespass against us. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus Christ said this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, as the soldiers who were to crucify him divided up his clothing. He showed his love for them by forgiving them, even when they, he knew they didn't deserve his forgiveness. Let's pray that we can forgive others the way that he forgave us. Dear God, thank you for all that you do for us. We pray that we make your name known to this world by forgiving people in the way that you forgive us. Use us as your ambassadors to help your kingdom grow. Help us forgive others even when it's hard to, and forgive us when we struggle to do so for others. It's in your heavenly son's name that we pray these things. Amen. Let's take a moment and let's pray for our country and the people in it. God, thank you for the blessings you give to us every single day. I pray that the people of our country can learn to do your will in our lives. Please be with us and do whatever it takes to grow us closer to you and furthermore, bring us closer to each other. Forgive us for our mistakes, God, and help us to grow from them. Send your heavenly sense name we pray. Amen. everyone, thanks for joining us today. High schoolers, tonight after our 5 p.m. service, we're going to be having a swim party at the Petty John's house, so make sure to come for that. And middle schoolers, you're also having a swim party on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. at the Johnson's house. We'll see you there.